We are heading towards a world where uh, we will know much more about our bodies before we get sick. And one of the things that I've rallied against is the old concept, and you're a trained MD, you know this, of, of medicine thinking of treating disease rather than treating the patient before they get disease. And so that we have to shift from that mindset to take care of people throughout their whole life before they get sick, because what's driving most of these diseases, including sudden death uh, from uh, an infarction, uh, unstable plaque or even soft plaque, is the aging process itself. And that's happening every day and depends on how we live our lifestyle. And that's largely slowable, that the way we live our life will actually slow down the ticking of that clock in my lab here behind me. We are routinely measuring that clock in mice and in human samples. It's very clear that some people age much more slowly than others, and 80% of that effect is not genetic, it's based on lifestyle. Um, just a personal note, I, I had one of my best friends die last week uh, suddenly from a heart attack while he was driving home, um, professor at, at Cornell, and I've had lost three people in the last couple of years, very close to me for the same reason. So yeah, we do need to take preventative action and measure things as best we can, and it'll only get better. Yeah, the, the stat I, I was with uh, a mutual uh, friend of ours, Eric Verdon, up at the Buck, and we were talking about this. The stat that he threw out is that genetics account for 7% and lifestyle for 93 percent and that's extraordinary because we do have control over our lifestyle uh, but the point you made which and i also uh, brian binney who was the pilot who won the ansari x prize made the flight again felt dizzy went to sleep never woke up you know at age 69 and people don't realize this that heart disease does start early and it is to a large degree preventable you know it is expensive, but this is where the work that you do and to some degree my companies do is going to change the game. I'll give you one example, which I'm excited about. Uh, and this, uh, you know, we have this enzyme in our liver, PCSK9, that generates our bad cholesterol, our LDL. And, you know, we've had these monoclonal antibodies that cost ridiculous amounts of money. It's like five, ten thousand dollars a year. And so it's not a first line defense to lower your cholesterol by 50%. Uh, but we've just finished our primate studies and are going to humans uh, on a vaccine against the PCSK9 uh, enzyme, right? And it will be 50 bucks a year. And you can sort of do this preventively. And, and uh, I mean, you can talk about the, the CRISPR edit of the PCSK9 gene. Well, this is exactly the kind of thing that needs to be done. And I commend you for, for supporting that uh, kind of development. Uh, you know, I talked about the, the expense, and, and you and I talk about this a lot, is that it starts out for the rich and let's call them the elites who are pushing the boundaries. That was That's true for all technology. The printing press wasn't available. Books were not available uh, initially. Flight was not available to most people. Um, and it's going to happen the same way here. Computers get cheaper and, and biotech is going to get cheaper, and you're helping that. Um, so what I'm looking for is uh, in the same way that you are, uh, reprogramming. So it, now we use gene therapy. We're in non-human primates now, correcting vision, restoring uh, the youth of youth of the eye. Um, that's still going to be a uh, a therapy that is expensive. Gene therapies are expensive by their nature, but my lab is working um, extensively, hurriedly, with passion. <laughs> on yes, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> yeah. I, I walk in every day and push them harder uh, on our behalf, those of us who are over the <laughs> certain age. Uh, they do have molecules and combinations of molecules that can reverse aging um, without gene therapy. And so th those chemicals could be very cheap. They could be a few cents a day, maybe a few dollars to reverse aging, and but save trillions, tens of trillions of dollars um, overall in GDP costs for the US. And that's the kind of buck that you get. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's great. I mean, picking up on the point you said earlier, uh, I think people need to realize that, as you said, technologies in the beginning that are only affordable to the rich also in the beginning don't work that well. Um, you know, the mobile phone in the beginning was a you know $100,000 device and would drop a call for a Wall Street banker on every block going down Manhattan. And then by the time it works really well, it's cheap and available to everybody. And hopefully the work that you're doing is going to democratize and demonetize these uh, these things and picking up on the trillion side, I'm sure 
I know you know the stat that came out, I don't know, nine months, a year ago, that a single additional productive year of life for the human population is worth $38 trillion, the global economy, which is, I mean, that's mind boggling. We, we calculate it, it um, and by we, I mean Andrew Scott um, and other colleagues uh, in the UK. We've calculated that it's it's actually eighty six trillion for the U.S. alone, uh, extending li- healthy life by one year, and if you do ten <laughs> okay. years, it's three hundred and sixty five trillion for the U.S. Uh, and so this is <laughs> the only way of saving that much money is to stop military spending, which obviously we're not going to do. And this is money, remember, that can be used for developing new medicines, education, tackling climate change, pushing technology forward. You know the 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 idea that slowing aging is going to bankrupt us and overpopulate us turns out to be patently false, demonstrably false. And uh, so that's why you and I think that this is one of the challenges of our time over the next five to 10 years to be able to achieve uh, cheap, safe, effective age slowing and age reversal. It's a moral obligation. (laughs) And I think people need to realize that. And there's such a pushback. You know, I think people don't realize there are so many institutions that exist today that don't want that because they've built their entire existence on the fact that we die and the fact that we are not living longer. But it's the single greatest gift you can give humanity and any individual. It's all about framing the question. If I ask people how long do they want to live, most people will say, oh, over age 90 or 100, come shoot me. Um, it often offends the, the 90-year-olds or 100-year-olds in the audience. Uh, <laughs> I'm also uh, on record saying nobody who's healthy, who has friends, wants to die tomorrow. Nobody, no matter how old they are. Age is irrelevant as long as you're healthy and happy. And that's what we're aiming for. But if, also, if I frame the question differently, it is, if you could be healthy at 120, would you? And almost everybody wants that. And so it's not the longevity that people want, it's the health that leads to longevity. And the good news, the technology does that. I don't know how to make someone live longer without keeping them healthy, do you? I'm curious. I've had conversations with Ray Kurzweil about this idea, extensively about uh, uh, longevity escape velocity, right? The the point in time in which science is adding a year to your life, uh, greater than a year for every year that you're alive. So it's divergent and you escape and then I've also had this conversation with George, George Church, a, a mutual friend, uh, working with us together on our age reversal X Prize, which maybe we'll talk about. And they both gave me a number of when they think we'll reach longevity escape velocity. And I am curious if you're willing to offer one. I already know how to ostensibly uh, make someone less uh age than they currently are, and I can work with them to make them more than a year younger within a year. So I would say we already have knowledge how to go back more than a year every year. Now, the the critics will say, well, David, you're just measuring the epigenome and you're measuring some biomarkers. That's not proof. And the answer is, yeah, you're right. We're certainly not far away from a future where we're able to, if nothing more, stop the aging process. And I truly believe that. If you look at my biological age based on a number of measures, I'm at least a decade younger than my chronological age. My birthday candles would tell you. Um, And I'm not that good at exercise. I could probably be a lot younger if I tried. Uh, So I really think that, that, that we're on this cusp if, if you ask me in, what, 1903, uh, are, are we close to flying? I'd say, yeah, we got the technology. It's just a matter of when, and it's probably going to happen in the next few years. Okay. So you didn't actually give me an answer. You gave me a sort of answer. So I, I, but the question needs to be uh, a finer point because you're right. It's like, could you theoretically now? When will you? So I guess the question is, uh, when will a set of treatments exist that might allow age reversal and be accessible to some segment of the general pos- uh, you know, public? All right. Uh, 10 years. 10 years. Beautiful. So that's what, that's, what Ray, that's what Ray said. George had it at about 15. 
But both of those numbers are shocking. So, I mean, when I'm on, when I'm speaking to anybody interested in this area, I'm saying, listen, your job is not to live for 50 years. Your job is to live healthfully for the next 20 to intercept all the technologies coming our way during that period of time. Exactly. And so my father's on that trajectory. He's 83. He'll be around all goes well, uh, at least for another 10 years. Um, so I'm, I'm talk about motivation. Um, it's not just about how long do you want to live? It's how long do you want your family to live? And when you phrase it like that, you know, who wouldn't give a lot of money to spend an extra year with their parents? 